Our technologies basically is, uh, is it software for space, basically, Erin? Is that what Oh, it's just about everything. It's mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, software engineering, all to build satellites, bring them into space. And we even have an AI uh, sector of our tech department, too. Right. That's fascinating. So your job now is to recruit, um, or is it recruit everybody? Is it still technical in, in the sense of recruiting software, hardware people for this business? Uh, for the most part, it's it's pretty heavy in IT. Every once in a while, I help with a electrical or mechanical engineering role, and then rarely, maybe you know, a finance one thrown in there. But um, most of the people that we have need security clearance as well, so that adds an extra layer of a challenge when oh, the tech market is already tight. And, so and no, I remember recruiting for security clear people. It was like shrinks the market by about uh, ninety nine percent, and you end up in a really tough uh, situation. But um. That's really cool. Anyway, we are live. Um, so welcome everybody to Brain Food Live on air, episode 43. Um, I am super excited today um, because not only am I making this call from Neisner in South Africa, um, where I'm currently having a bit of a break, um, but I'm also um, have, a, have a new co-host and an upgrade from Adam Gordon. It's Aaron Matthew from Maxar <laughs> Technologies. So Aaron, uh, always a pleasure to bring you on the show. Uh, if you could tell people very quickly what you're doing now, she's got a new job at Maxar. So give us, uh, give the uh, the audience a bit of an overview as to, to what your current role is. Great. So um, I yes, I started a new role as a strategic sourcer at Maxar Technologies. And uh, we are a company that is primarily known for making satellites and uh, Google Maps actually uses our satellite data. So I am primarily sourcing for roles uh, that are mostly IT, uh, but most of the people need security clearance. So that adds an extra layer of a challenge when it comes to finding the professionals that I'm looking for. We already know that the tech market is really uh, tight at this time. So <laughs> add security clearance to that and it's that much more narrow and it makes messaging that much more important, which is exactly what we're talking about today. Indeed, and that's the topic of the show, super excited and super relevant. So I need to bring in um, a big thank you for our sponsors this week. Sponsors for episode 43 is actually one of my favorite uh, platforms uh, in the business. Uh, they've been around the game for, for much longer than a lot of recruiters have. It is Stack Overflow and Stack Overflow talent is of course a must have uh, tool, I think, for anybody who's recruiting for software. I'd be very surprised if you're if you're recruiting for software at volume, software skills at volume, that you have not heard of Stack Overflow talent um, and have not used it. You should certainly check it out. I've just shared the link in there. If that's a mystery to you, shame on you. Um, uh, but please do uh, check out that business and thank uh, thank you Stack Overflow for supporting this podcast. Okay. So moving on to, uh, before we move on to the meat of the show, we always start off with a quick review of recruiting brain food, um, a newsletter I send out every Sunday. Um, everyone's, uh, by the way, watching this, uh, more than welcome to sign up to that newsletter. Um, quick one for you, Erin, did you read it? And if so, what was interesting for you from last week? Oh, I for sure read it. And there were a whole lot of thoughts that I had on several of those items. But the one that stuck out to me the most was the article from prison to Python. And that was written wow. by uh, Shaw Wallace Stevens, who spent 18 years in the San Quentin prison. And during his time there, he actually had access to learn Python programming. And I guess my thoughts about this had a whole wide range of ways to go from this. And uh, my thoughts were that what a great way to give people that are incarcerated a better chance at giving back to society after they've paid their debt and, you know, serve their time. Um, and, and what a great way for them to be able to give back to society and to have a usable skill. Um, and it also kind of occurred to me with the labor shortage that we have for IT, um, could this be a possible solution to at least ease a little bit of that, um, especially in the US when we have incredibly high incarceration rates? And, um, you know, there, there's really a lot of layers to that. And uh, I personally don't believe that every single person who's ever committed a crime deserves to pay for it for the rest of their life. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's, it's kind of like, how do we get these people to turn their lives around and start contributing to society? And um, I guess there's a lot of layers uh, with that, especially because a lot of employers, no matter what your skill set, will not hire you if you're a convicted felon or have served time. So how do we resolve 
that issue of it as well. There's just so many layers to this. You know, so important. And I will stick my hands now in, in a bit of shame, actually, because as a former recruiter myself, I was I did reject people because they had an unexplained gap in their resume, CV. I qualified them on that, and they did say, actually, they were in uh, prison during that time. I didn't forward it on. I, di I didn't escalate it. I didn't have a conversation with the hiring manager. I just said, okay, this is more problems than I can handle. I'm sorry. I'm moving on. Um, and I wonder how many people w are doing that and making that as a default decision um, and really shutting the door for people who um, have may have paid their dues. Um, certainly that's what society have said. They've paid their dues, they've come out of prison um, and uh, our job really should be to encourage them to come back in. But an essential read, I've just shared that link there from prison to Python. Is prison, um, uh, certainly incarceration rates in the US is shamefully high, right? So it's not only people that are, are being in jail, but also people who have previously been in jail. So the overall population is into the millions. Um, uh, these are, I would imagine, people that are struggling to get into the market economy. Um, and you do wonder, um, you know, there's a, a labor resource there we should tap. Anyway, it's an inspirational story. People should check it out. Okay, uh, what else uh, was interesting for you, Aaron? Uh, the four day work week, I think that everybody has uh, some very uh, polarizing opinions about uh, whether or not we should go to a four day work week. And uh, this was uh, it, the article covered uh, how it worked for a Dutch marketing agency. And uh, the author argued that it only worked because it was a trial period and people wanted it to, uh, which, you know, I, I guess there is some weight to that. But, um, you know, I, I have more questions about what a four hour work week would mean for hourly employees, for one thing. Uh, you know, is are they going to have their pay adjusted to more accurately reflect what a 40 day work week is? Or are companies going to be like, wow, we'll make them think they're getting a benefit, but we're just going to pay them less because they're working less. You know, yeah. uh, does that mean something else for benefits in the US where they, they no longer have health benefits because they're working less than 40 hours a week if that's the situation? Is it four tens? Uh, so I, I think that um, the one thing that I agree with him, though, is that, um, you know, we'll start thinking of results more than hours if we went to a four hour, a four day work week. Right. Absolutely right. And, and Bass, by the way, is very prepared to, to take contrarian positions on it. He, To his credit, he does argue the position quite well. So um, I, I think his main point was, hey, four day work week is all great. But you know what? The only great right now, um, because they are they are an aberration. Uh, from the default of five day work week. And if we went to four day work week by default, actually everyone's just going to feel exactly the same. So it's the, the sense that, that it's special, um, I think is the point he's making. But as you say, there's lots of layers to that. It's not like, what does four day work week mean? Um, and will employers kind of not adhere to the spirit of it? You know, will they try and shave stuff off, as you say, in a, in a 10 hours a day instead of uh, uh, you average eight? So we'll see. Um, but you know what? I think it is a movement that's happening, definitely in the UK. Um, we're recognizing that there's no point in, in putting people through, through this period of time um, when a lot of the time we're not productive in the office. Um, I estimate my time of productivity throughout the day to be certainly less than eight hours. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sitting there being productive for eight hours. It's like max four, maximum four. Um, and the rest of the time is like, I don't know, recovering from the stress of those four, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, I think there's definitely scope for it and I'm for it, four day work week, let's go. Okay, uh, last thing, Aaron, what else was interesting for you before we start jumping into the meat of this, uh, uh, this show? Yes, uh, so Sophia being a team of one for TA, oh. I can't even imagine. Um, you know, I, I definitely think that in a situation like that, I can see how you would have to lean a lot on automation for certain aspects of, uh, you know, being the she only does. person yeah. in TA at your company. Mm -hmm. Um, but aside from that, I would get lonely. I mean, I, I kind of feel like within our own TA departments, we can commiserate about certain things that are, you know, stressful for us. Like when, when hiring managers want a unicorn candidate and we've given them five and they just want to, you know, see three more of them, you know, there's just certain things that you can commiserate with, you know, with, with certain, uh, employees that have shared experiences. And I remember at my last job when I was the only sourcer and that alone was kind of isolating because, the mindset of a sorcerer is just a little bit different from a recruiter where we love nerding out to all of these hacks. And then I would try to share them with recruiters and they would kind of glaze over, I guess. Glaze so, over. 
it's it, it can be uh, tough being a team of one in any situation. So hats off to her for tackling that. And I'm interested to see how the rest of that goes uh, in her time. <laughs> you, you know what? I think Sophia is really good at this. And she, she seems to be like, and I don't mean she's not a team player or anything, but her last two couple of opportunities seem to be she's op operating as like a multi-handed one-person machine de dealing with everything. And I've, I've listened to a few of Sophia's talks and she does talk about automation a lot. Um, she, she does find a way to do all of the, you know, the legwork and get these machines to help her, particularly using things like Zapier and IFTTT to kind of automate processes, um, push a lot of the work to the candidate side. If and when, you know, to give them agency, it also means they do work, um, scheduling appointments and stuff like that. And also, of course, invoking support from hiring managers um, to, to take on some of that workload. But you are right. I think sometimes it can be a lonely place uh, as a recruiter. You know, everyone's doing stand-ups. You're, set, you're sitting down. <laughs> you know, I, I yeah. remember that very keenly. You know, all these developers doing stand-ups. And now I'm sitting there thinking, where's, where's my stand-up? Um, but anyway, I've just shared a list of, uh, like, the big list of online recruiter communities. I think one of the reasons why these things have started to emerge is because of the profound loneliness that does exist in the recruiter job, particularly if you're a solo recruiter in a growing business, which probably is still the most common type of recruiter out there. Um, and then we've, uh, the good thing is, I think the last five, six years or so, we've seen an, an emergence of all of these online communities, typically based on geography. So you can join one of those groups uh, and you can share some of the war stories and you know the support and stuff. So big list is there, go and check that out and sign up to it. Uh, sign up to any of those uh, uh, communities that will let you in. Uh, okay, um, let's get on to the, the meat of the show, um, Aaron. We are talking about um, how to message software developers. There's 520 people registered for this show, which is a record for Brain Food Live. I've got 170 people live right now, um, and that's not even counting the 200 or so watching on Facebook. So lots of people interested in the topic. Um, why do you think that this is such a popular and a topic for recruiters? I said, I, I sort of shared something on LinkedIn that went completely viral, so obviously touching a nerve. Why do you think messaging is now the problem? Um, because there's so many recruiters that are still set in the mindset of volume versus quality, and I think that that's not always necessarily their fault either. Uh, a lot of you know whether it's hiring managers or. Uh, you know, agencies having specific quotas that you have to reach out to this many people. I, I think that quality is inevi inevitably going to suffer in that respect. And then, you know, IT can be difficult to understand if you don't personally do it yourself. So I think that's a craft effective messaging. You don't, you don't have to know how to program, but you have to understand what each of the languages and frameworks do. And I think that there's also a hesitation to really get in into the granular aspects of that to have a, a decent understanding. So I think it's um, maybe not grasping the knowledge. And um, in addition, I would say lack of creativity. Um, yep. You know, I, I hate to say it, but a lot of people have fallen into recruiting simply because they didn't know what else to do. And if they've made it their career, they may not know how to get out of it. So they stay in the same roles pushing the same messages with, you know, kind of forgetting why they liked recruiting in the first place. Right. And, so, so um, it's a very good point. I'm going to just lead with this one, Erin. So what you're saying is actually because recruitment is not a desired role, let's say, let's face it, you know, very few people actually actively choose to do the work we do. Right. I've, I've um, met one in my lifetime. Was that was that me? Because I'm I'm one. I'm, I'm I, I could be the other one. Um, so yeah, it's rare, right? You fall into it. So maybe because we do fall into it, um, uh, we 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 kind of uh, succumb more easily um, uh, to you know the crank in the machine. You just get on with hitting the numbers and and, and then move on. So it's, it's maybe uh, we got to look a little bit about the, the the types of people we recruit at the very beginning of the of of, of the career um, and not just have this. You know, just get this raw meat into the uh, the engine and see who survives at the end. So point number one is that. Um, second point you mentioned is the lack of fluency in terms of their technical knowledge. That's a common complaint from software engineers, by the way. And if there's any engineers that are kind of watching this, please do comment on this to see whether this is true. Um, Erin, I seem to have lost your video there, but I hope you're still there with us. I'm still here. Can you hear me? That's okay. I think it'll, it'll come back. Um, but basically... Um, Lack of fluency on the tech side, that's going to take time, isn't it? It's going to take time for, the, for, for recruiters to get to the point where they're 
fluent enough uh, in the language to to do the job. Um, so, so what would you suggest to recruiters on in that basis? You know, they still have to hire. Um, are you saying they should not message people, um, or should there be some sort of you know uh, 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 what is the what is the training program to get people up to the point uh, where they're fluent enough to have that conversation? Um, I really think that it just takes a little bit of homework on your point. Uh, you know, I at, at one time when I was very new to recruiting front end developers, I, I kind of had a hard time grasping the concepts. And then what I actually did was I started taking some of the free preview uh, seminars offered by General Assembly. And yeah, yeah, um, yeah. after a two hour course in HTML, CSS and JavaScript, just covering the basics of all of those and having some hands on coding experience myself, everything else made so much more sense to me. So, you know, I'm not like a master programmer or anything like that, but I know enough to understand what I'm seeing on the screen when I'm looking, you know, behind the source code of a page. So there's just so many free resources out there. You know, if I, if I'm, you know, waiting for something, I, I'll, I'll pull up a video on Udemy or something like that and, and say like, oh, I want to know a little bit more about the basics of this programming language since this is what I'm recruiting for right now. I, I just think that in an age when there is so much free content out there, there's no excuse not to seek that yeah. out. Yeah, yeah, great point. So I'm just sharing a few of these links there. A lot of these coding boot camps and coding schools, which are there designed to generate sort of coders, I guess, they offer, often offer entry level stuff for free. Um, yes. And if you're a tech recruiter, you don't need to go that deep. You just need to look at the entry level stuff to get a, an idea of how it all fits together. Um, and that's certainly going to be enough to do the job. Uh, that you need. So um, so we can uh, kind of solve a little bit, a bit of this by being um, kind of getting into the mindset that you don't have to sit there waiting for training, which is never going to come, by the way, because we know no. that recruit is uh, massively underfunded in terms of personal development. Just go out there and actually think like a coder or at least someone who's maybe getting into coding for the first time and learn the basics, which you can do in a couple of hours um, on Udemy, um, you know, General Assembly, lots of other different uh, uh, tools like that as uh, sort of uh, stuff like that. YouTube, in fact, could be, uh, yes. uh, is, is, is literally go on YouTube. There'll be dudes on there or women on there producing little tutorials. It'll teach you a little bit more than what you need. So um, there's also a very cool extension I'm going to share with the group here. Oh, uh, made tech, yes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> this is a good friend of mine, Andro, Andre Stetsenko, built this. Um, and it is still one of the most used and deservedly so, one of the most used um, uh, Chrome extensions for tech recruiting. Very simply, all it does is that it highlights terminology that you come across on a profile and it will give you a quick uh, uh, a kind of uh, explanation as to what that is. Um, so download that, get better at the job. Okay, um, what else is the problem, Erin? So we've talked about uh, lazy, not lazy recruiters, I don't think that's really true, but maybe, maybe people who aren't passionate about their jobs are coming to just the numbers. We've talked about lack of literacy and fluency on, on, on the terminology and so on. Um, what other things do you think recruiters are doing um, uh, that is, uh, you know, really leading to, to driving these uh, developers away rather than encouraging them to engage? Uh, I would say calling at the at, at the wrong time or through the wrong methods. Uh, you know, for example, I'm I'm vehemently against calling people at work. You know, you never know what kind of situation they're in with their current role, and you know, if they get an unexpected call from a recruiter and their manager finds out about that, you could have just created a really uncomfortable situation for them at their job. So um, I think that in some situations, persistence is good. But there's a definitely there needs to be a line, uh, and you need to recognize that these software is, developers are getting is absolutely the, bombarded. Is, the phone, is the phone call dead, Aaron? For for this segment, I mean, would you say you cannot call software developers? Uh, I personally prefer if I'm going to use anything by phone, it's going to be text first. You know, I think that a lot of times, uh, especially with robocalls, people aren't going to answer anyways if they don't recognize your number. So um, I, I, we actually use a texting app where I work uh, so that, you know, they can actually unsubscribe from it if they really don't want to hear from us. What's the uh, texting app? Let's plug the uh, tool. We use uh, Text Us. Text Us. Okay, I know them. Uh, Text.us, isn't it, is the, the yes. thing? Yeah, yeah, cool. 
So how, how does this work? You buy a volume of text or something, um, and then you can you can do it off the de off, off the desktop, uh, sort of a desktop or something like that, isn't it? Yes, yes. You can text from a desktop, and then they'll give you numbers for the area codes where you're actually recruiting in. Cool, cool, cool. I think the U.S. is well ahead of everyone else in using text, uh, SMS. Um, I think the Europe, I, I don't know. I mean, I've never oh, used it. Oh, yeah, um, we gave the wrong URL there for that. It's text us. Thank you, Michael. Uh, is, is that wrong? Okay, well done, yeah. whoever. Michael Vroman. Yep, awesome. Yeah, he's my coworker, so he, he's is watching. He? <laughs> Great. I need the help of the community to sort my crap out. So thank you very much uh, for correcting that mistake. Um, okay, I think the US is very, very good at text um, in the sense that for fluent with it, people respond with it. The very, uh, I think, probably more used of text in terms of personal usage than perhaps people in Europe are. Um, I, I'm not sure whether we should, we should definitely learn more from having this uh, type of soft touch, low, uh, sort of zero synchronicity type of communication. I think the problem with calls is that it demands synchronicity from the person receiving it, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. and that person might not be able to deal with it right there and then. Um, they are busy doing, very few people I know are sitting there waiting for the phone to ring. Um, they're already staring at something and focusing on something, I guarantee you. Um, so a phone call is always an interrupt. Um, and if you're a highly skilled in-demand person, the last thing you need is yet another interrupt. So. Channel choice important. Text first. Call uh, after you've after you've arranged a, a time and a place for that to happen. Um, okay, cool. Uh, what else, Erin? Um, what else do you think? We're starting to rack up these things that recruiters are doing that you shouldn't do, and also providing solutions, which is fantastic. Um, but what else would you say that recruiters are currently doing that they should not? Huh. Um not sending creative messaging uh you know i kind of want to go back to the lack of creativity part i i think that the reason that i've had a moderate amount of success actually engaging with software engineers even if they're not interested is because i i have several guidelines that i always have when reaching out to developers i'm concise so i like to tell everyone think in tweets you know we we don't have an attention span for a, a book of you know, information that you're going to send in messaging. Uh, I'm as detailed as possible in that short outreach as possible. I'm going to tell you where is this located? What's the job title? Who does it report to? And um, anything that's, you know, necessary to pique their interest right away. And most importantly, be entertaining. Uh, I like to say that um, I'm probably going to get a no, but at the very least, I'd like to leave them with a positive impression of me as a recruiter. So something that I did at my time when I was working at FTD, I created comedy sketches about certain developer roles that I was recruiting for at the time. So I would send those uh, to the uh, developers and say, you know what, um, I'd love to talk to you about this role, but even if you're not interested, I made this video for you and I promise you'll at least find it entertaining. Oh, tell what is it, comedy sketch? Uh, what? what are we talking about a drawing or are you doing some oh, it's, or it's, it's terrible oh it's comedy sketch so like you know uh like a, a little comedy routine like on saturday night live or something like that right uh, and you would record yourself doing this is that right yes and, and then i forced wow. all my co-workers to act in them um <laughs> i think they're glad That's i'm amazing. gone for that reason um but uh yes um i can actually uh put the link to one of my videos on youtube into the chat here but Please i actually so. had a yeah, uh, on YouTube. So I had I had a character that I made up called Brad, and uh, mm -hmm. he was someone that comically misunderstands um, all of the job titles that we have for developers. For example, the video that I just put into the chat, it's when he was uh, hired to be a Java developer, but instead he's walking around the office giving everyone coffee and say like, hey, I made lattes. Hey, I made a macchiato. And then it ends with him in the boss's office, and they're like, well, how's your first day going, Brad? And he's like, great i'm developing a lot of great java and then they're like okay but when are you going to start coding he's like coding and then it cuts to me saying please don't make us hire brad let's chat you know what that's amazing and you know i do want to click on this video and watch it um but I'm, i wonder what's going to happen with my screen if i do it so i'm definitely going to watch it uh, 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 a little bit later I think that's really great creativity. Um, and sometimes you're right, you've got a differentiation, I think most people would agree, is an important part of getting any kind of engagement, particularly with people who are getting a lot of volume coming at them. Um, but 
caveat to all of that is that people might say, Aaron, that's fantastic, but you know what? It's not realistic for me to do a video because of the time reasons, cost reasons, um, you know, compliance reasons maybe. I don't know. Um, I mean, do you think that this is – can you tell us sort of what was your thought process when you are building this? I mean, and, and did it kind of cost – what is the, what was the, 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 the cost for you to create these sketches? Free. I, I just shot them on an iPhone and uh, I edited them in iMovie and mm -hmm. it was entirely free. Um, the challenge was convincing my coworkers to actually act in the videos with me. Um, you know, Wait, it's, how did you do that? So um, I, I kind of, um, I would give them actually a storyboard of what I had in, in, in mind for. And, you know, I, I called a meeting with the recruiting team saying like, okay, which part are you comfortable taking? And Got thankfully, it. at the time, our uh, our director of HR had a previous background in improv, so I didn't have to do much coaching with him. And he's actually the guy that plays Brad. So um, I got lucky in that aspect. But, um, you know, I, I I kind of got the idea because I had always wanted to go into sketch comedy, but instead I became a recruiter. So I was like, well, here's the perfect opportunity and we'll see what uh, happens. I see. I see. Perfect. So I'll tell you what, this is quite interesting because this is almost evidence that people from creative arts could be very good recruiters. And I do believe that's yes. true um, because there's an element of, of performance. There's also resilience. Like you've got to take a lot of, you know, you've got to be prepared for people to, 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 to basically heckle you. Um, oh, and they, you they know, do, but you know. Yeah, <laughs> you've got to be stuff. So I can see all of the, what where that's coming in. So maybe going back to our first point when we're talking about um, you know, we need to be a little bit more intentional about the types of people we bring into the, the industry. We should be looking at the stage. We should be looking at the creative arts because perhaps those are the people that can do these creative things, natively do these creative things uh, to, help, uh, to help do it. I'm going to suggest a, th a thing to a lot of people who are watching and listening to this and, and might be thinking, yeah, but I'm not that creative. Um, you, but you know what? Video, I think, can help. Um, yes, uh, video it doesn't have to be fun. It does not be funny. A friend of mine called Mark Lundberg, um, I don't know whether you know him. Um, he's, oh, yes. he's, a, he, he's also a very experimental recruiter. And he, he is like massively disciplined with the idea of sending video notes um, in his email um, so that people can basically uh, get a, a kind of a feeling as to who he is. It's not just a, like words on text, but you can see Mark. He's addressing the candidate, and the candidate obviously is, is getting a personalized message. So he's doing two things there. He's humanizing himself, number one, and he's personalizing the message. Um, and that elevates him from all of the, that mass mail merge stuff that's coming at you. I forget. I think he, ju uh, he just uses Loom, uh, which is a screen um, a capture app, free software again. So lots of cool stuff that you don't have to spend any money um, to, to use. Um, and all he does is record 30 second videos. Um, and those videos uh, are uh, outreach messaging uh, for the candidate. Um, oh, by the way, top tip for anybody who's using the video on screen technique. Apparently, the best way to trigger a massive amount of response to your video is to get a pen and a paper and write the name of the person you're messaging uh -huh. and hold it in front of you as you're shooting the video. Um, and apparently by doing that, um, uh, it will also carry the preview image in there as well. So basically, the person who's receiving it knows that you've created this video for him or her. Um, right. So that's the top Hyper tip from the personalization. <laughs> Hyper personalization, but cheaply, right? Yes. You're not spending a lot of time, a lot of money doing this. That tip, by the way, is from a guy called Ryan, Od Ryan uh, I forget his second name, Ryan. Ryan something Scottish. Um, but he is a CEO of a video tech company called Audro, and this is what he does for business development. He literally writes the name of the person he taught who wants to sell to in a white piece of paper, then he records the video. And apparently he's saying this is like a, a, like a magic technique to get the response rates up. So anybody can do it, go ahead and crack on. Um, okay, um, what else, um, uh, there's, you know what, on the LinkedIn thread that we talked about, there's a few people that mentioned it was actually not the content of the message that was important. Um, uh, we, everyone is, is kind of, this person is saying, it, we're, we're, we're making a mistake by focusing on the content of the message. It's actually the identity of the sender. So what do you think of that? Um, people are rejecting the message because it's a recruiter sending it, um, irrespective of how great the message is. It's literally they don't want to speak to recruiters. 
Um, any any mileage in that uh, premise, um, Erin? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I remember someone else said in the thread that they knew someone that uh, was a software engineer that creates dummy profiles just for recruiters to spam and they don't check them at all. <laughs> so harsh. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and absolutely. You can see that's true. Oh, by the way, um, people who are interested in this show should really check out that thread because there's been about, you know, I think some like 180 comments on there uh, from recruiters who are sharing experience and techniques on this. I think definitely dive in and get some of that value. Um, I think that the, the lady who mentioned, I think it was a lady, the lady who mentioned about the identity being more important than the message then led me to think, you know what? Maybe the role of the recruiter will shift um, away from being the person who's doing a primary outreach, uh, but instead being the person that facilitates the outreach from the people that developers do care to hear about, which is other developers um, or technical managers or even the CEO. So, you know, our job might be to actually get those characters involved in the messaging outreach um, and not ourselves because we're getting lower and lower responses uh, oftentimes because of our identity more than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it does mean more coming from another developer versus from a recruiter. Um, I, and there, there's always going to be people who just immediately send our emails to the delete pile. And, you know, I don't really yeah. know that there's anything that can be done about it. Uh, but like I said, I, I think that the content of the message is pretty important. But yeah, I, I wish I knew the answer for that. But, uh, you know, I you know just what, hope that I'm not... <laughs> no, I, I think I think it's in stages, isn't it? Because the the message, or you're already communicating something by who is by the sender ID, um, and then we've got to think about the subject line. And there's a lot of science coming in, especially if it's email. You know, what is the subject line, and how do you put? Uh, you know, what kind of things will trigger an open at the very least? Um, and then there's the message. The message is actually a third piece of this chain. Um, and I do wonder, you know, maybe uh, we could use a different type of technique, which is not necessarily worrying too much about the creativity side, but you know, spend more energy building internal relationships with hiring managers and your tech team um, and getting them to perhaps support the outreach somewhat. I forget who it is. I think it was Michael, Michael Batman or something. My brain is not working. Yeah, oh, yeah, Michael he, Cohen. Yes. Is that Batman. the guy? Yeah. Hi, hi, Michael, if you're watching this. I think it was him. If it isn't, please uh, forgive me who it is. Yeah, um, I'm pretty he, sure that was him on the thread. <laughs> yeah, but wasn't it him that said that um, he his technique was actually to invoke the help of the the, the technical team? It might have been Adam Godamski as well. I don't know whether it's one. Of, uh, he he made that comment, but he said that actually I don't do a lot of outreach. What I do is spend time speaking to the development team internally and getting them to help me do the outreach. Um, and and kind of circumventing this uh, kind of instant uh, rejection, instant hostility that we get from uh, software developers because they've been inundated by uh, these these messages. Um, anyway, um, Aaron, um, I'm going to try and bring somebody else onto the screen. You stay here. In fact, no, because your camera has literally gone offline. I'm sure people like oh, to see no. you as well. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to kick you out of the call, and okay. then I'm going to reinvite you back in. Um, and then hopefully the video will come back on and all will be well. Um, okay. But in, in the same time, what I'm going to do is try and invo in, in, invite uh, Mark Dubel onto the call as well. Uh, Mark is a recruiter for Elastic, Elastic Search, big famous um, database company, which you know all of these uh, software developers do actually want to hear from. Um, and I want to get Mark on because he was actually a former developer. Um, so he's kind of uh, sort of got the, oh, people can see Aaron. Um, right, Aaron, I'm not going to kick you off. It seems that it's only that it's only me that I can't see you. Um, so other people can see her, that's fine. Um, I'm just going to invite uh, Mark on um, and uh, see if he can join us for the chat. Oh, by the way, Anton Boner is going to join us for, uh, uh, from Stack Overflow. He's got some data on this. Um, so the reason why I wanted him to also join the call is because he might validate some of the comments we're making in terms of message length and stuff and, uh, and so on, at least insofar as the Stack Overflow platform. Um, but, uh, but anyway, uh, you're staying on screen because everyone can see you apart from me. Um, and, and hopefully Mark will join us shortly. Um, do you know Elasticsearch, by the way, just out of interest, uh, Aaron? Uh, I do not. I should, but I do not. <laughs> no, I, I, they're an open source database. So I think we, we, I've used them before. I think I'm still paying an invoice for them, actually. Um, I should stop that. 
Um, but yeah, they were formed, I think, in, in the Netherlands by about by four dudes, um, and they're, they're now like a multi-billion uh, uh, turnover business. But very interestingly, remote only, um, never had an office, that kind of thing. Um, they recruit loads of developers, and they have this opposite system, I think, where actually lots of developers want to work for the business, um, and Mark's problem is actually to, to knock them back. But um, the the reason why he's coming on board is really because of his his technical uh, background. Uh, I'd love to hear what he thinks about um, you know messaging in general and what you've got to say to developers uh, to get that uh, kind of engagement. Um, okay, cool. I think Mark's joining us. Um, let's see if that is happening. I believe it is. Um, okay, there's a question that's come in. Um, hi, Aaron. As uh, who's this? This is from Steve. Um, as you know, um, getting responses from polygraph cleared software engineers is always a challenge. What have you used to be successful? Um, I'm not sure what po polygraph is that a lie detector so, test? I mean, so there, there's different levels of clearance within the United States. Um, there is, okay. you know, secret clearance, top secret, TSSCI, TSSCI with a CI or full scope poly. So um, people that have a poly clearance are very hard to find and um especially you know hard to get a response from too uh because they're constantly being bombarded with messages if you take the typical experienced uh it person and you add a clearance that high multiply the difficulty by 10 to get that person to respond so i've been uh i've been doing a similar outreach but um obviously in the cleared space i have to be a little bit more uh, reserved. I, I can't be sending the Brad video to them or anything like that. But no, I do have yeah. where I introduce myself and, um, and and another sorcerer that I work with. So we just, you know, we do a little bit of banter. We talk about what we do. And then I cut to a video of visuals that I, I made about our satellites um, so that they, they know who we are and they know what we do. Uh, so that's essentially what I've been using. And I've had a good amount of success getting response rates. And what I think is most notable is that I get responses from people saying, I'm not in the market for a job. I wasn't interested, but because you took the time to make me a video, I'll talk to you. So that is the, the number one thing that people say in the cleared space to me with that. Right. I think videos need to, we just need to do it. Um, yeah. And, I, I mean, and not enough recruiters do it, even though, you know, we'll emphasize this in the call, I would say a very small percentage of people actually will. So I would yeah. never worry about video getting, you know, flooded in the market in terms of outreach because so few people do it now and so few people I think will. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, basically video uh, is, is non-intrusive. Um, it is something people can consume, I would say, rather passively. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they can listen to it if they want. It's usually quite short. Um, mm -hmm. So if you do all of those things, basically I think people would do it. I tell you what. Uh, the cognitive load in, in processing information through video is also lower than reading text. Um, I think reading text is really quite a strain to the brain, which is why we don't tend to enjoy doing it um, and why attention spans are going shorter and shorter. However, video, we can listen to it, watch it, see people's faces, etc. Very easy to do. We just got to get on it. Um, so anyway, I think Mark's joined us. Uh, Mark, how are you doing? Um, are you, can you hear me? I can hear you. I hope you can hear me as well. Yeah, great. Um, Mark, thanks for joining us. Very quickly to the audience who don't, don't know you or the business, can you just quickly introduce yourself and what Elastic is? Of course. So um, first off, I'm not a developer, ex-developer, right? I'm more of a sysadmin, a uh, sysengineer. Um, Should be the same thing, Mark. Field. I can't code, just a little, <laughs> the little Python, that's it. Uh, um, so I've been in engineering for about 22 years uh, before I switched to recruitment um, a few years ago. I first tried two agencies. It wasn't really my style, so I went to, uh, to Elastic. Um, Elastic is a search company. So basically, we deliver everything around search, um, database, um, visualizations, logging, um, and security nowadays as well. So we're quite a complete platform uh, that you can use for basically everything. Um, if you use Tinder, if you used Uber, uh, basically you used us. That's amazing. It's, it's, by the way, Elastic's got an amazing story. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a classic example 
uh, archetypal example of, of I think four mates basically who, who built this thing for, from the very beginning. So great story to, to, to hear. Anyway, Mark, you've heard Aaron talk a lot, and m myself and Aaron discuss this issue about messaging software engineers. How do you do that, and, and what are the techniques? Um, hearing all of that, was there anything in particular that you agree with strongly, and anything that you disagree with? Uh, hearing our chat earlier. So, especially the personalizing stuff, um, that's the most important thing. Uh, I certainly agree with the title, the, the, the fact that people see recruiter and they won't respond. Um, mm -hmm. You have to be creative in how to reach out. Um, if you st start a message with the standard heading of, hey, I'm a recruiter, no way it's going to happen. Um, what I normally do is I introduce myself as a coworker at Elastic. I introduce Elastic more than myself. Um, they will see technical recruiters somewhere down below anyways. But basically, I'm managing the hiring for, and that's not a lie. Um, it kind of leaves the recruiter part out of it, and the response rate is much higher. Um, I so don't send ex jobs. Ex ex yeah. ex explain this to me. Um, so but I'm trying to visualize this message, OK, Mark? Yeah. Um, so I'm a, I'm a developer, let's say. I've just received an outreach from you. What is the first thing you're saying to me? What's the first line in that message? The first line is, hey, I'm Mark Dale when I work at Elastic, the creators of Elasticsearch, Logsash, and Beats. That's kind of what the intro is. I don't say my specific uh, role. Right, right. Just, so it's it's, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a definite no. As soon as they read Recruiter, it's done. I did the same thing. When I was in engineering, I saw Recruiter, and I was done. Interesting. Very interesting yeah. insight. So you kick down Recruiter all the way down lower into the, into the yeah. process. In fact, you may even change the language to say you're managing the hiring, something of that effect, which is actually yeah. correct. Um, yeah. But you lead with the company um, or you lead with the brand. I think, Aaron, that's probably similar to what you were doing when you're talking about shooting videos of the satellites, right? You're talking about what the, the employer does um, as the main thing you talk about, or at least the intro or the hook, uh, rather than introducing the job or, in fact, uh, your identity uh, right, up the, right at the beginning. I don't even provide a job description. I don't do that in the first okay. outreach. I don't. I just talk right. about the company. I talk about why I approach them. The, the emphasis is on them. Why am I interested in you? What makes you better than the rest? You know what? They call this you messaging, don't they? I don't know whether yeah. there's any, like, uh, one of these new wave writer coaches or, or gurus watching this, but it's like either me messaging or you messaging um, in the sense that you locate the content of the copy in either yourself or or, or or the person you're addressing. And of course, it's more compelling always to locate it in the person you're addressing. So, okay, so the structure is you lead with, okay, I'm Elastic or working with Elastic, they do this, this, and this cool stuff. Then you go into uh, a, a bit of detail about what this person is um, and, and yeah. I guess showing understanding about who what they do. Yeah, definitely. So you have to show them that you actually understand what they do. So simple things okay. like, hey, I saw your amazing at React. Do you have experience in Redux as well? Simple things. If you, as a recruiter, understand the relationship between uh, between technologies, it opens them up because they have an idea that they under, that you understand them, right? Okay. Stop. Press right there, Mark, because glossary text suddenly becomes much more valuable right now. Um, because that's a quick and easy technique for recruiters to to demonstrate their knowledge is to simply observe a technology that this person claims to have experience in because presumably you've got a profile of some type um, but then you can get kind of a related technology in that family from glossary tech which i think does that it kind of uh, creates a taxonomy which of related terms and then you can ask a simple question to have you got any experience with that um and that might then immediately generate some credibility definitely and um, like I said, it's a you message. Um, I like to believe that's give, 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 and then ask. So it's give them a reason why am I talking to you. Give them um, the information, not per se about the job, but tell them a little bit about the team. Tell them a little bit about the company. Then tell them what's in it for them. That's the only thing they care about. They don't want to know if, they, if, if the company has a table tennis table or Friday night drinks. That even works against it because a lot of people are introverted. They don't want to hear, hey, yeah. every Friday you have a drink, because then they think, shit, I have to go to drinks every Friday. Um, it's that's not story. <laughs> yeah. And at the last moment, then you ask, hey, do you want to have a chat? Still no job description. Yeah. So you, basically, you're hostile to the job description as a marketing tool. I hate it. 
I right. hate your so, so essentially, okay. By, so by when rule, did you I come to this realization, Mark? Because I would say most recruiters would dispatch that off the first email. Is it literally check out this job description? Is this you? Why is that bad? It's so you're basically not paying attention to them. You're basically saying, "Hey, watch this link and let me know what you think," instead of actually starting a conversation. Right? You want to start a conversation. Mm. Uh, if you start the conversation and then you get something back, then you got them in. If you send them the job description um, and they look at it and they even remotely think this is not me, it's done. Well, you have they're a reason right. yeah. to contact yeah. them, right? And job description That's mostly, it. to be honest, they're bad. Yeah, I, t I tell you what, I would guess if you do send a job description, any recruiter, any developer that does read it is looking for a, a, a no straight away. They're looking for a reason to know it. Um, so that's a very important point. A job description is not only a useless marketing tool, it's an, actually an anti-marketing tool. Um, it has negative, a deleterious effect to your response rate because I think you are firstly forcing the person to do a, a lot of work, right? You're forcing the person to actually consume this and then them to tell you uh, are they're suitable. Whereas you're meant to be, at some degree, an expert of suitability, so you're meant to say, look, I know you're, you've got potential, uh, great fit for this. I want you uh, in on this. Okay, great. Um, anything else to add to that, Mark, before I bring in um, our final... Uh, we're all going to stay on the screen, by the way, but I'm keen to bring on Anton on as well, because he's going to help share some data with us, um, which should be very interesting for us to observe. Anything we haven't covered that you think is quite important when it oh, comes definitely. to tech, messaging tech candidates? Don't ever ask Go for ahead. referrals. Don't ever ask for <laughs> referrals. That's the most terrible thing. Even now, I still get them from recruiters or even recruiters that f still think that I'm in engineering. They ask me, hey, yep. would you like to be joining this job? And if not, do you know someone else? And I'm like, so you're not interested in me. Bye-bye. It's just networking. It's, it's, it's the worst thing you can do. Yeah, I think this is something that recruiters have been trained to do. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I think going to your first earlier comment, Aaron, I think you mentioned about some some recruiters, obviously agency side being run by the numbers effectively. I'm pretty certain back in my early early career in agency, I was also targeted on numbers of referrals. Um, so I can imagine that driving behavior to the effect that you are asking, you know, um, it, it's all it, it's too transactional. It's like I don't if you don't want it, give me somebody. You know, give me somebody. And it's like yeah. why? Um, so. Yeah, no asking for referrals. I think we've, we've got a lot of uh, uh, interesting insight from the stuff we don't do. So don't send JDs, don't ask for referrals, do be creative, do be fluent in the technology, which personal. you can do with the, and personalize it, and humanize it. So personalize yeah. it and humanize it with video and, and stuff like that. Okay, um, that's great stuff. Um, anything else to add on that, uh, Mark? I'm going to see if I'm fine, Anton, but if you've got any other ideas that you think might be relevant to the audience here, so I actually, anything you I actually, want to share? I actually have an engineer of Elastic Online, uh, Jan Kostrotberg, who okay. might be able mm -hmm. to give his insights as well. He's, he's happy to join on. Is he, on is the, he there? Yeah, he should be there. Let's get him on. What's, what, what's his name? Janko Strasburg. Janko. So I've got a Janko here. He's not put his second name in, but it's Janko as in J-A-N-K-O, correct? Yes. Okay, it's sure. Janko, you're on. You're on, mate. I'm going to invite you on now. Let's see what happens. Okay. I think that's how, man. We've just got a sl slow connection. I'm, I'm, uh, I blame myself, actually. I'm, I'm in a new kind of environment, so I, I don't control... Uh, a lot of bandwidth and in fact i can't see either you or aaron on screen so i'm, I'm so we're still on screen. um yeah yeah i think so i think people can see you okay so that's fine um that's great stuff you know what a lot of the people who are still watching the show um i think yanko is here oh there yep. he is yanko hey how are you doing man good thanks great. for being here thank, thank you very much for joining the show I, 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 and thanks for watching i'd be really interested in your feedback <laughs> on what you've heard so far um, I and mean, what are your impressions on the, the, the conversations that Aaron and, and myself and Mark have, have shared so far? Yeah, it's, it's very true. And you, you really see as, as a candidate, as a potential candidate, the difference that they basically put into their first messages, how the, how the whole talks go. And yeah, we agreed in the chats also on, on lots of things that, yeah, it can be too much and it's more get people interested and see what, yeah, if they're interested, if they're not interested and don't send just random messages out to people that 
doesn't fit their profile at all. So I get a lot of junior positions still sent to just because of my language skills or whatever. And it's like, mm -hmm. you didn't even read anything, you know? So it's, it's very obvious yeah. sometimes. You know what, Yanko, that was that's something that Aaron and I and Mark actually, we haven't actually surfaced that, but inappropriate jobs um, is super annoying for anybody, never mind mm -hmm. um, technical people, but it demonstrates a level of ignorance. Uh, and secondly, if you're getting introduced or suggested for a job that you left behind five, six years ago, it, it's kind of a, a, an insult. You, you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> what do you think? I've not developed further than this. Hey, I've got a question for all of you, actually. I think that a lot of these messages are as a result of improvements, quote unquote improvements, but improvements on CRM technology. So in other words, um, they are not necessarily sent, uh, obviously they're not sent personally. They're literally, someone searched a database, they've done a segmentation, and they've just pressed go, and it's gone to 150 people. Um, it has to, because even I get messages as, you know, being in talent acquisition from other recruiters, and even we don't like those. You know, we, yeah. we don't like, you know, non-personalized outreach. You know, way, way back in my career, my first job out of college was selling cars. Do you think I want a sales job now? No. <laughs> oh, and, and, and then, and you know what? So what do we do about this then? Go on, Mark. Go ahead. And the second thing is that um, a lot of recruiters just use a simple Boolean string. I get approached for hydraulics uh, roles, for engineering roles in, in uh, gas turbines. Yeah, I did that about 20 years ago. Then I switched to IT. But it still shows up in your profile. So they do a lazy uh, search. And Yanko can probably attend, well, hang on, uh, test hang on. I'm, I'm, I'm totally defending lazy <laughs> recruiters here because I do think this is a, I, I think it's a database problem, guys. Um, no, because it's a bullying, the person it's doing a the issue. search, yeah, yeah, no, man. It, I tell you what it is. It could be, but it's still a search problem, right? In other words, <laughs> the search parameters they're putting in are not sufficient enough to figure out the uh, the timeline. Uh, of when these skills were most used. And I think that's basically because the data in the profile isn't there. It doesn't describe it. Um, so we haven't found a way to, to, to uh, kind of put a weighting um, on these skills. Um, and pro if it appears in the search, then I'm sure it just gets banged out. So I think an increased sophistication of this might help. Um, but you know what? A friend of mine, actually not a friend of mine. I speak like Donald Trump now, aren't I? Uh, everyone's a friend. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> There, there was a, you know, that's what he does, isn't he? Um, yeah, I'm good friend of mine. No, uh, there was someone on, there was someone on the string on on the the LinkedIn string that said, um, when he was first trained into IT, so he was a recruiter from his exec search. He got moved into IT, and he was given clear instructions to use the recruiter LinkedIn recruiter, this whiz bang new tool to basically do what uh, we were talking about, which is do a quick search. Get 150 uh, candidates. You obviously can't read or, or see every one of those, and just crank out a big mailer. Uh, and and of course, there's going to be a, a segment of that 150 people or whatever the number is that's going to receive an inappropriate message. However, there's also going to be a percentage of people that would receive that message and feel very personalized. It would be so. So there's is a weird scenario where um, we're not getting penalized for the bad stuff we do per se. Um, because that recruiter who's cranked that machine might still get the two or three candidates in the pipeline by punching out this mail merge. So I think you know, we've got to figure out sort of how to, to, to uh, I guess, segment more, more accurately, I guess. Uh, I don't know whether I mean, you database guys. they get two people, yeah. but uh, then they ruin it for the rest of us recruiters, and then they get the impression that, you know, we don't actually care about people and what they want to do. So that, that's I hate to true, say it, Aaron, but, but the people that do it ruin it for the rest of us. Yeah, that, that is true. But also, there's no reason for them to care, right? Um, because for, for, for the recruitment industry in general, or uh, recruiters that are not me, uh, having a bad rep doesn't really hurt me. So I think we have, we have a problem in terms of the distribution of responsibility and accountability for bad, bad behavior. I think actually Stack Overflow does something about this. And I'm keen to get Anton on here, because don't they have a rating system for messages? whereby, you know, I think you get a message allocation, you get 20 messages or something, and if you don't get a certain score, the allocation reduces um, so that you, your ability to continue to message actually might be compromised. So it incentivizes you not to crank the big mail around. And I think they've never actually implemented 
uh, a mail merge facility on their platform because of this entire, it may be something you can never solve. Anyway, I'm going to try and bring Anton on the call. Actually, before I do that, Yanko, uh, I don't want to let you go too early. Is there anything else that you could advise recruiters to do? I mean, coming from a person that's receiving a lot of these messages, what's the one thing you, you would recommend a recruiter do? Because I think there's a lot of well-meaning people out there that simply are, are making uh, mistakes out of, out, out of a lack of knowledge. Yeah, so basically out of all of these, uh, I don't know, hundreds of yeah, recruiting offers or whatever I, I received or messages, uh, only I think two stood out. So they were making really um, the point of looking at my CV and saying, oh, you went through this, you did that. So this kind of skills, they would be really well to apply here. And funnily enough, one of them was from a female headhunter and the other one was from the recruiter at Elastic that uh, got me in, completely oh, cold yeah. recruited. I didn't even apply. They just found me via LinkedIn and say, oh, wow, I see you have this background. I see you did that. You're working in this kind of area. So we are looking for these kind of skills and you might mm -hmm. not have exactly our technology, but you can learn that because, well, we saw you already moved around. So something like it's obvious if something is targeted towards you, like you said earlier, with uh, handing, uh, holding up the paper with the name of the candidate or whatever in the video, yeah, these kind yeah. of things. So you notice when something is with a bit of more work done and not just like send out to everybody like a spam, basically. Yeah, yeah. I, te I tell you another thing, Yanko. You might have introduced an idea we haven't shared yet, um, uh, but it's about sort of the... Um, it, it could be the, we, there's a there's a different type of demographic where the big mail mail merger might work, um, but there's a demographic where it doesn't work. So we we might need to vary these techniques. And I just wonder whether some of the recruiters that um, that we're talking about in terms of bad actors here may may simply be applying um, practices that might work for I don't know retail workers, let's say, um, and, and thinking that or, or thinking that's how you would recruit contractors. I would imagine. You know, if you're working in a fast-paced interim type of uh, uh, basis, you might actually send a lot of messages out to, uh, on checking on availability, um, and that habit might translate um, badly into the permanent world of work. So it's a very interesting point. Um, anyway, Yanko, I'm going to let you go, and the only reason why I'm doing that is because I think I can only have five people, four people on the screen any one time. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and sharing your knowledge. Uh, with this, Yanko, I'd be keen actually maybe to get you back for another show because there's another thing that I need to talk about, which is mm -hmm. happening next week. I just talk about how to assess software engineers. Um, so not only is the challenge how do you um, uh, uh, message and how do you engage, but actually once the person's engaged and you know showing some interest, how do you actually identify and assess this person as being uh, compatible and suitable, functionally capable for the job? Not easy to do. I'm talking with Susanna Frazier about that next week. So, um, Yanko, if you're around, it'd be great to get you on board for that as well. Um, uh, oh, yeah, but, that sounds very interesting. Yeah, I'm sharing mm -hmm. a link for people to, to join that show next week. Um, so please do that if you're free. Um, but, Yanko, what I'm going to do, I have to let you go. So have a great weekend. Um, uh, I will now bring um, Anton on. He is waiting patiently. I can only see Anton. He is not second name, but I think that's Anton. In he goes. I hope this is the right person, by the way. Um, if it's not, we'll you know say hi to, to whoever's on the show. Um, we'll continue. Anyway, uh, reason why I want to bring, bring Anton on, because he is um, the uh, UK manager of Stack Overflow. Um, and there he is. Anton, how are you doing, man? Good. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly fine. Thank you for being patient, Anton. No uh, we're we're a little bit behind the the the, uh, the schedule. I hope you've enjoyed the show and listened to it in terms of you know what we're discussing. I've been um, I've been chomping at the bit ever seeing the uh, discussions on LinkedIn, and then for the last what is it fifty eight minutes, I've just been stood here waiting to, waiting for my turn. <laughs> I'm sorry, mate. I'm sorry, but I'd, I'd, firstly. Um, Great to get you on board. And Stack Overflow is one of the primary platforms uh, that tech recruiters should be using to recruit uh, software engineers and to message them in platforms. The reason why I was keen to bring you on, on board is because you've got some data for us in terms of what sort of messaging seems to work. So I wonder whether you could share with us some very quick, okay, here's what bat recruiters who are not getting responses do. Here's what recruiters who are getting responses, what do they do? Yeah, so if we start with uh, a result from our developer survey, which which goes out every year, um, the number one thing that developers would look for in a job are the languages, frameworks, and other technologies that they're going to be working with, which goes back to Erin's first point of do recruiters know their stuff? So 
Um, there's lots of links that were already shared in the in the chat there of you know how to brush up on knowledge. But I'd go back a little step further on speaking to your hiring manager, speaking to the CTO, the dev team about that specific role. Um, and then we also have a bit of a cheat sheet. Um, I'll drop it into the chat. If that's all right. Hong. Do it now. I was going to say share the, share the good news, man. <laughs> take, take your uh, take your role. Um, so this cheat sheet it's, it's developer one hundred and one. It will give you an idea of how technologies and frameworks uh, work well together, and it will give you, you know, de developers don't look for, you know, an in-depth knowledge of what you know on the specific job, but it is good to have a basic understanding. Uh, don't ever get into one of those conversations when you pretend you know more than you do, oh. because it will go very wrong very quickly. Yeah, they will totally expose you uh, if you're going to try that, so do not do that at all. Uh, listen, everyone should really download this um, download this guidebook um, because if it is what Anton says it is, I think it could be massive, you know. Uh, so uh, before I – obviously, I can't type my stuff in and get it. Um, but basically what this does is designed for tech recruiters and it explains what technologies are, how they're related, and how they fit together. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. So the, the, other, the other kind of key point, um, especially when messaging developers, you, you mentioned uh, that it's potentially a database problem. I have to disagree with you there, Hung. So – I get messages for technical roles all the time and I have zero technical capability. It's just the Stack Overflow logo that people from technical backgrounds, uh, you know, use Stack Overflow on a daily basis. So they see Stack and think that I'm a technical person. I'm not. Um, the, the, the stat which is quite interesting is that 65% of developers are open to new job opportunities. So if you think about this in terms of who you're messaging, 65% of people, if you're picking the right person, as Yanko said, the right seniority level and the right technology skill set, and message them in a compelling way, then you're going to be around that 65% plus response rate uh, to your messages. But What's that stat again? 60 what percent of developers are open? 65% of developers are open to new job opportunities. Wow. See, that's a stat I think recruiters need to know more and hear more about because they're obviously getting a lot of responses to say, look, I'm not available. And then assuming that that's a, a definitive declaration of this individual not caring about any job role. It's not that they're not available. They just don't want to talk to you about your job. Exactly. Um, and they want to get you off the line. So actually, developers generally, I guess like most human beings, actually, you know, we're all we're maybe not be active job seekers in terms of sending applications out. But if someone came to us with a great job, we'd probably have the conversation in some way. Yeah. Um, it, we've just got to get the, the accuracy up there. Okay, so great. On the, on, Keep the, on, the flip, on, yeah, on the flip side of that, so if, you, if you're you know, posting on job boards, et cetera, the active uh, candidates within the developer communities only 10%. So messaging is even more important when you compare those two stats. 10% are actively looking, 65% are open to new opportunities. So the only way that you can, you know, reach out to these people is through messaging or being in places that they're hanging out. Um, you know, they like Stack Overflow, GitHub, uh, hackathons, any community gatherings, stuff like that. Okay, important point. Stop press. Basically, if a candidate is active versus a candidate who's kind of openly look uh, open to opportunities, your you, your message quality actually has to to change. In other words, you have to pay more attention to someone who's open to opportunities because that's where the messaging is going to be have a critical and decisive uh, response. You can't use the same message or the same kind of treatment uh, of communication. Uh, to an actively uh, uh, active job seeking candidate compared to someone who is kind of looking for opportunity. Um, okay, good one. Keep on going, uh, Anton. This is great. So I kind of I want to sort of uh, mirror what Aaron said. You know that the the creative uh, style that you're going to send messages out is definitely going to help. Also, um, you know the way that you actually engage with developers, Mark. You you, you give some really good points on. Um, that that sort of initial subject line. Um, what we've learned from a lot of our clients is that. You know, if you don't have the time or capacity to link or, or um, partner yourself with a, a hiring manager or a CTO to write the messages, at least get, a, you know, someone with a technical capability to, to browse their, you know, their GitHub or a specific piece of content which they've released into the dev community. You can even start that in the subject line. We love your X, Y and Z app, which you recently released. That in itself is going to get an open because that is very specific to that person. It can't be sent to anyone else in that in that company because it's a, something that they've created. Um, and then we would aim for three personalized points within each message. Oh, um, interesting. This is great. What, t t three? Why three? So three is, I mean, you could go 10 if you want, but three three at the minimum. And, and by personalized, I don't mean 
you have .NET skills, you're a great .NET developer, you need to go deeper than that. And it's referencing things like that um, project which they created that you saw or, some, or, a, or a previous company that they worked out, maybe the skills align uh, nicely. Um, one thing that we do on our, on our database, which is gonna stop people from um, messaging Mark about his, uh, his, his skills in the past is we have a um, not interested in so you might have you might have uh, you know ten years experience in JavaScript or whatever, um, but you don't want a job in JavaScript anymore. You're not going to remove that from your profile, but we can include not interested in JavaScript, and that will remove them from the list, uh, so that you get uh, a more you get a more accurate search. Yeah, I tell you what, this is where probably Stack has a little bit more granularity than LinkedIn does, because I don't think LinkedIn can quite do that. Um, it just you always obviously have your list of skills. Um, and I, I can't remember a way to declare whether you're interested in, in future stuff. Um, so, so that's very interesting as well. Um, okay. Anything else Anton to add to this? It's been like 10 minutes of like gold uh, that you've brought to us straight away. I'm trying to talk really quickly before everyone drops off. Um, <laughs> so there's, there's a few things that you probably on the call this is great there's a few things that you probably want to find out from your engineering team um, before you reach out to candidates i mentioned speaking to them if you can't get on obviously download that guide you're going to have a better technical knowledge but the things that you're going to be wanting wanting to ask your team when you sit down with them even if it's at lunch or 15 minutes is you know um how is what we're building different from the competition you know which which um what changes in the last two to five years are most in, uh, fundamental to the team and um, what things are on the roadmap oh, are the team excited about um, and what ways what ways does our company solve problems differently from the competition? Um, again, this is uh, a guide which I can pop into the into the chat, which has a lot more detail than I can go through today. Okay, Especially you know what? Roadmap. All of those questions that developers want answered. Um, sorry, Mark, go ahead. I said especially the roadmap that really helps. I think if you talk like to that. people and you talk about the roadmap, that's okay. The big thing that they want to know. Yeah, what you're doing in the future is a lot more exciting than what's been built in the past. That's done. What What am I going to be building if I join? What am I, um, what am I needed for? Why Why do you desperately want me? And and give me the reasons why you want me as an engineer. Don't just tell me that I'm a .NET developer and you need to fill .NET roles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I tell you something as well for everyone who's watching and listening to this. If you haven't caught on already, but the 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 questions that developers want answered. Um, they could be brilliant questions that they're necessary questions for you to take to your hiring manager and say, you need to answer these questions, Mr. Hiring Manager or Mrs. Hiring Manager, because without this, I can't sell this job opportunity. This is what the developer community is actually looking for. Um, and I think we'll end up getting much richer information uh, from the hiring managers than, than you know, just accepting a, 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 a JD, you know? I mean, um, the, the quickest thing and dirtiest thing they'll do is ping something over and say, here's your brief. Uh, no, uh, we need to take those questions and ask them uh, to the hiring manager, make sure we get that information. Uh, that will help us have the conversation. It will also help us write messages and do all of that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah. great. What else uh, that can you give us, Anton? Yeah, so last little point. I, I remember uh, Jerome mentioned this last week. Um, he was, you know, you, you, often, you often get handed these job descriptions and, and you just have to, there's a lot of must-haves in there. Um, there is a lot of transferable skills in tech. You know, you, you can pick things up relatively quickly if, if you have X, Y, and Z skills. So, you know, just to echo what he said last week, start focusing on the must-haves and start looking at the must-achieves. And sometimes you need to ask the team that. It might be written in your job description as a list of bullet points. You go through them and you're, you're whittling your um, pool of candidates down to nothing because you think that everything is essential. It's not. If you understand the frameworks and you understand the sort of technologies which work well together, um, and get that uh, get that advice from your team. That open up, opens up your pool of candidates to people that you uh, potentially would be missing out on. You know that's a really good point, Anton, because it could be that they sort of they mean the hiring manager send us a uh, what looks like a list of requirements. But it, we we if we don't investigate, um, you know what the relationship between those bullet points are, we might be over. We might be assuming. Uh, that they're absolutely essential when in fact they're not. And um, Jerome, I just shared the, the last week's show, the video for anyone who wants to register and watch it, watch that. Uh, it's free to watch. But that was an essential point he made. I uh, was that it's a mindset shift from must have to must achieve. So in other words, future fo from the historical focus to future focus, what is it that this person needs to achieve to be declared a success in the job? Um, and that's what you start building your search around. Um, and in fact, that's what you build your messaging around. 
um, because you know this is going to be much more compelling thing to talk to someone about rather than interrogating them about you know whether they have this or that skill. Uh, you can then together have a future focus on you know the project work that they'll be doing. Okay, Anton, listen, I'm burning a lot of your time here, so I just want to give uh, one more thing that you can give us before we let you go. Uh, I know that you mentioned our database, so maybe maybe a little plug at the end. So we don't we don't obviously allow any uh, mass mail mergers or anything like that. Uh, this kind, of, I mean, this kind of echoes almost what everybody in the uh, LinkedIn channel has been saying. What everyone in here said today, it would go against everything that we would ever try and advise our clients on. Um, so yeah, if, if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me. All right, and so I'm going to ask you a tough question. Actually, you might not like this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, you've got two products, don't you? Um, Stack Overflow Talent. I've just shared that there. Um, now I understand that your you one of your products is, is the advertising products, so you can you can go and post jobs there. I believe is that right? Um, and the other one is the search. But you actually, it's a package, isn't it? Um, if I if I go back and buy Stack Overflow Talent, do I get both of those things? Uh, and I must take both of those things. Is that correct? Yeah, so if you see Stack Overflow as a community of developers, and I mentioned being in the places that they hang out, mm -hmm. if, if you haven't heard of Stack Overflow, every developer is hanging out on our site, you know, asking each other coding mm -hmm. questions. So we start off with direct advertising. So we follow them around on the site with um, roles which are specific to them as granular mm -hmm. seniority and technology skill set. Um, mm -hmm. You can also message the developers, and we can also send your brand out there to the community so that you can actually the second highest. Uh, Second highest result to our must-haves for technical roles that developers look for is um, is actually the the culture and the office working environment, so that you can show that off within the company pages which we push out. Yeah, fantastic, Anton. Listen, you've come on you've come onto the show and just like fired bullets at us for the last ten minutes. That's absolutely amazing. Thank you very much for sharing that, and indeed sharing the ebook. I would absolutely recommend people download that. Uh, it sounds like it's something that if you're a tech recruiter, you need to have in your locker. Um, okay, um, Aaron. Final thing before I let you go. Uh, what's the one bit of recommendation you would give to uh, a recruiter, tech recruiter struggling uh, right now in terms of messaging? What would you say that they need to do to 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 to, to as a takeaway from, from this session here? Actually take what we have expressed here and put it into play. You know, a lot of people will sit on webinars and be like, oh, that's a great idea, and then never do it. There's just so much to be said for actually doing it. Doing and and it. It will, you'll mm. still set yourself apart from the crowd. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Mark, final word from you. Uh, what's the one sort of takeaway uh, you would impart to the audience that's been listening to the show? If you, so, partly two. So one is um, less is more. Don't reach out to 100 people. Reach out to the 10 that you actually think they're worth it. And the other one is if you want to understand tech, if you want to sell the job, sit next to the team, not to the hiring manager. Sit down to, with the team and source with them. That helps. Yeah, so you with the team, are you talking about software? But you sit with the developers to do that? Or, yeah, so or what? I actually sat down with some people on the machine learning team. They had a role that I just didn't understand. And within an hour, I knew how it worked, why it worked like that, and how to find people like that. Because the engineers are sitting next to you and saying, well, this is missing on this profile, and this is not the project they were looking for. And that gives you far more opportunity than asking them, hey, what are you looking for? Because that's kind of a short answer. They have to think about what are we looking for instead of actually looking at the job and sitting next to them. And um, with Janko, I sat down uh, with the team, basically solving uh, um, um, support issues, seeing what they're actually doing. That makes you able to sell the job and actually, well, not sell, yeah. actually give them a job because you're not selling anything. Yeah. Sounds fantastic. Um, okay, Mark, listen, uh, thank you for that contribution. Aaron, Mark, Yanko, if you're still there, thank you for your time as well. Anton, thanks for being patient and all of your wonderful uh, knowledge share. Um, that's it for the show. We've kind of ran over time. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. Um, we've, again, record numbers, 530 people registered. 145 are still watching this. I don't even know what the numbers are in the Facebook group, but it's probably twice that. Uh, hopefully a lot of people have got some value from the expertise that we've shared so uh, thank you for joining everyone um, if you're interested in this type of show by the way do follow the channel um, I'm trying to do these shows every week where I'll be bringing experts like this on uh, to talk about important topics in the uh, recruiting business 
Um, also, uh, make sure you uh, subscribe to Recruiting Brain Food. That's a newsletter that I, that I curate every week. Uh, it's full of great content like that. I'm just sharing the link with you there. Um, and we'll be back next week. Next week, we're going to be talking about how to assess software engineers. Um, so this is not about finding, not about engaging. You've got your person. How do you know that person is the right fit? How do you know they can do the job? Um, Susanna Frazier is going to join us. I think Yanko might do. I've got a friend, Andrew Lawson, engineering manager at Monzo, who's going to join us as well. Uh, so we're going to get tech heavy again. How do you look at a tech profile? How do you talk to a developer? How do you kind of figure out they can do the job that they say they can? Okay, that's it. Have a good weekend, everybody. Cheers.